Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of the Garage Gym Podcast. Today we have Carla Robbins, the founder of Vital Strength and Physiology. And her and her partner are writing a book right now that we're going to hear about in a little bit. But to start us off, Carla, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, So just to clarify, my partner is not the same as my business partner. Um, So I'm writing a book with a business partner. (laughs) Business partner. Yeah, that's what I meant. Different different than the other partner. Um, And so, yeah, uh, a little bit about myself. So I grew up in Kelowna. BC, uh, moved to Calgary in 2007, and thought I would leave after four years of my undergrad at UFC. I was like, oh yeah, I'll go back to BC. It's better there. (laughs) Um, And what are we now? Like 14 years later, I'm still in Calgary. And, you know, in the meantime, completed my master's of kinesiology and and my undergrad and a couple other uh, things and certifications, and I haven't left. And so since moving to Calgary, I've worked for many different places. Um, you and I, Alex, we met at Peak Power when I was um, in a bit of a transition phase. Um, didn't have anywhere to work, so I started renting out of there. And yeah, the rest is history. That's the short, the short story, I guess. <laughs> so you said you took that Master's of Kinesiology. What made you decide to take that as opposed to something else? Um, yeah, I... I guess it was like during my undergrad um, that I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the kines degree. I knew I wanted to do the kinesiology degree, but I didn't really know what the next steps were. Um, And every one of my classmates wanted to do chiropractic and physiotherapy and massage therapy and, you know, all of the the hands-on physical therapies. Um, And I had shadowed a few clinics before, like even in high school. And it just wasn't for me. Like, always dealing with pain like usually people go see physio chiro massage if they're in pain and I wasn't really interested like I mean it's kind of uh, ironic now now that I work with a lot of people with pain but I wasn't interested in only working with people in pain and so exercise physiology was like one of my favorite classes it was scientific but it was applied and it was cool and one of my uh, un- my uh, TAs at the time he was doing the MKIN um, and it seemed the way he was talking about it, it seemed like it was broad enough and applied enough and different enough that like it was really interesting. So, you know, the MKIN program deals with like the big spectrum of like uh, disease and like chronic pain all the way to like elite and high performance athletes um, and kind of the physiology and training methodology and testing methodologies behind all those things. And so, I mean, that sounds cool, right? Yeah. So I was like, this person seems to be liking it. And I interviewed a bunch of the other students at the time that were taking the program and they all seemed to love it too. So um, I started to go that route. Um, the same year I graduated my undergrad um, and wanted to apply for the master's and get in right away was the same year it went on hiatus for three years. Um, and so for better or for worse, I took three years to, um, we didn't know how long it was going to come back, but it was three years of just diving into um, the practical side and trying to get a job and, you know, working for the Canadian Sport Institute and all, all these other things that, and opportunities that presented themselves. Um, but yeah, then after three years, got into the MKIN. So that's, that's that story. Um, and it's, yeah, it was a great program. I would highly recommend it to anybody that's not wanting to do the physical therapy side of things, but's interested in exercise, physiology and stuff like that. Yeah, it seems like a whole lot of people that go through the kin undergrad want to do that physio chiropractic side of things. But I definitely think the exercise phys is a little more interesting. I definitely agree with your mm-hmm. perspective. But taking that three years off in between degrees, do you think that helped or hindered you? Um, I think that helped me um, a lot because then in the MKIN program, I was really refined in what I wanted to get out of the program. Um, it wasn't like I've never worked with a client before. And so uh, I have no, I don't know how to ask the right questions to my profs. It was very much like, I know exactly who I've worked with in the past and who I want to work with in the future. And so, um, me and my other classmate, Michael, he was, uh, he sat beside me and we kind of took the same perspective there. Like he was, he very much would only study the things that were actually interesting to him. So he's like, I I know I'm going to pass. He's like, I understand the content, but I'm not even going to study or write notes on anything except the things I actually want to carry forward in my career. 
Yeah. Like if, if, if I'm not going to use it in the future or if I don't think I'm going to use it in the future, he like wouldn't take notes on it. Um, I still took notes on everything, but um, the only notes I kept were like my, uh, I forget the name of the class actually, it's like 773 or something. And it's like high performance, methodology something something with uh, Dr. Smith it was so good and I have two binders that are massive of his notes and I, that's the only thing I carry around with myself with my um like backpack and stuff most most days <laughs> yeah yeah I guess having that three extra years of perspective kind of helped you figure out what you actually cared about and what you actually wanted to learn as opposed to just turning it into more of an extended undergrad degree yeah and that would be my uh like critique of the program I've told the directors that before is that if you if you let kids in that have no practical experience um like the program just becomes just like a little bit of an extension of an undergrad instead of yeah. a really specialized program they only let in like 10 people every year for that program so it should be those that are like in my opinion it should be those that are like yeah extra niche and like extra focused and like extra um in need of like that advanced amount of information rather than just yeah I don't really feel like I can apply on my undergrad so I'm gonna try to extend my undergrad and still not be able to apply anything you know yeah I definitely find with Ken just because of how broad a Ken undergrad is a lot of people find they have difficulty getting a job afterwards and then they have no experience mm -hmm. and then they just go directly to a master's and don't understand yeah. how to do any of it because they don't have any experience but it's kind of a difficult yeah. situation either way because finding a job is never the easiest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, I agree with all that. So as a strength and conditioning coach now, what do you think differentiates you from everyone else now that you've done that Masters of Kin and you're, you are more focused on what you're doing? Or I guess on your niche rather. Mm -hmm. I, I don't necessarily know what differentiates me and that's probably like the number one rule of like owning a business is like know how you're different um I'm still trying to figure that out but what I've what I hear from my clients a lot which is kind of how I figure trying to figure out how I'm different is that um you know we actually listen to them that sounds so silly um I've, I literally had a client tell me this yesterday he's like I have, I've tried so many chiros physios massage other strength coaches practitioners he's like this, he's like, you're the first person who actually listens to what I'm saying and changes the program accordingly. And so I think that that's probably, if not the, one of the main things that differentiates me or us at Vital is like, it's probably one of the main things. And probably another one of the main things is like, we're not super tied to one philosophy or like one methodology we're always learning we're always trying new things we're always uh reading research literally every day and trying to figure out the answers to all these complex problems because we don't have all the answers um but it's probably it's probably out there somewhere um in just yeah talking to your client and, and listening to them and adapting the plan and um and or in someone else has had this problem in the past, how did they solve that problem? We can like implement some versions of that. Yeah, I think if I had to answer that question for you in saying how you differentiate yourself is that the way most people care about their clients is like here and the way you care about your clients is way up here. <laughs> yeah, like I feel like I, uh, maybe that's a bad thing because I like take work home with me every day and I uh, send people like I do extra work for people all the time um, because I, I really care and I really want them to get better. Um, but it's give me uh, extra stress. <laughs> yeah. That's really not the greatest be for work life balance, but yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, now I've hired a few people. I've got Nick and I've got Jenna, I've got B, I've got uh, Tessa and Brendan and I'm missing someone, Chantel. Like there's all these people that are kind of contacting with you too. And I think as a whole, like we uh, we're really detail oriented. We're really, um, we're not, I guess, cocky. We're not set in our ways. We're very like adaptable. Yeah, I think that's, that's important for sure. 
Yeah, just knowing the few people out of that list that I do, you guys all seem like the kind of people that, like you say, aren't tied to a specific philosophy and are open to lots of new ideas. Yeah, yeah. So speaking about philosophy, what is the philosophy behind this book that you're writing now? Um, yeah, the book is pretty broad. Um, so we're writing a book, Nick and I are writing a book, ebook, I guess, um, called The Gap Analysis. So the idea behind the book is that um, we want to be able to help um, other practitioners. It's mainly targeted towards practitioners and not just like clients um, to be able to help them to identify gaps that they see in their clients um, and help them fill it, fill the gaps. Um, so like we believe like performance and rehab are sort of not like separate things. They're very much on the same spectrum. And it tends to be that people, um, you know, who have pain, I guess, like, like, or what's causing the pain, I guess, tends to be some of the same things that are hindering their performance. Um, and so like, because like mechanics are super important for prevention of injuries and mechanics are very important for moving efficiently and being fast and powerful. Um, yeah, like they're, they're on the same exact spectrum. Um, so yeah, the, I wouldn't say there's a philosophy out behind the book, but the book is like, um, I guess, interesting for those who want to hear our perspective on training. It's, it's really like our perspective on training and then some step-by-step -step processes on how they can implement those things for their clients or for their athletes, I guess. Does that apply to a specific kind of athlete, like a few different sports, or do you think it's going to apply to every different type of athlete, every sport? Every type of athlete, every sport, and uh, every type of client, um, which is why it's taking us so long to write it, because we have so many ideas around these things, and we can't go on about every single example we've ever used, um, and we can't go on about every time like it's not worked, or why it's not worked, or how we would change things, um, but it, it will apply to like everyone um, and every type of client um, because yeah because of the fact that like they're all on the same spectrum um, of like humans are humans and we think that there are ways of moving that are more injury prone and we think there's ways of moving that are more injury resistance resist resistant um, and that like that our, our ways of dealing with those things or uh, treating those things like change over time a little bit um, but it's more of like a refining and not like a, a black and white skipping from one idea to the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. We like to use the analogy of like cars a lot. Um, and we find like the current uh, strength and conditioning, like field, I guess, as a whole are very much like, you know, just put more power into the engine, like just add more muscle. Um, and maybe that's because of like the roots in, you know, bodybuilding and Olympic weightlifting that, SNC has. Um, so a lot of, and we were like that too before, like, you know, you're kind of just taught, like, got to teach someone how to squat and like, you should teach somebody how to deadlift and like how to bench press and like how to do a pull up. And like, that's the basics of strength conditioning. That's how to lay down more muscle. Um, but if you had like an F1 racing car and I absolutely love F1 lately, so fun to watch. Um, thank you, Netflix documentary for getting me into that. <laughs> um, but if you had like an F1 race car or like uh, you were coaching someone in F1, um, instead of, you know, after the race saying like your time, hey, athlete, uh, your time wasn't what we wanted it to be. We wanted you to be faster. Um, so like just be faster. Instead of saying that, you would be like, well, in like curve three, you like took it too wide. Um, the tire change was sloppy and you know tire changer number three you were the slowest so like we need to improve on that and we'd say like uh the engine could probably also be power more powerful um but like here's all the little details of like where you broke down yeah. so let's fix all of that um and in snc it tends to be like oh you want you want to be a better athlete oh just like do some squats and uh yeah we're done. Like, you know, just more gas. I did, I did my job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah just more, ga more like powerful engine, but like, you know, the, the tires are like falling off or like completely flat off the car. And the, the person's like, yeah, yeah. Just add more engines. And, uh, there's a reason why, like, I mean, you know, the SNC world doesn't have like the best wrap all the time. 
because it's very like meathead oriented sometimes. It's like very bodybuilding oriented sometimes, um, which is funny because like that Nordics question that we'll talk about at the end, um, like strength coaches are so obsessed with like, let's do Nordic hamstring curls. Like then the athlete will never tear their hamstrings. And it's like, yeah, just adding muscle is almost always not the only thing you need to do. Yeah, because it might help if the problem is there's not enough muscle but there's this whole list of other problems it could be yeah. like you're saying, like if you're filling the wrong gap, you're not going to help. Yeah. And there's so many examples of, of teams and sports. Like if you've ever worked for any team that is uh, like, or any athlete that um, isn't maybe just powerlifting or Olympic lifting, because that's an example of where getting stronger is literally like almost the only goal. Yeah. Um, those are very like specific examples, but as you move to the other end of the spectrum, um, the middle and the end of the spectrum, which is like mixed sports, team sports. And then the other end of the spectrum is like endurance sport, like marathon running, maybe, um, in almost all the other examples, just getting stronger doesn't make you better at your sport. Um, so you have to like, look at the whole athlete. You can't try to make their bench squat clean and things better and expect them to get faster or better at their sport because often um and we see this with um, i've seen this with every sport i've, I've uh, coached the strongest person on the team is not usually the best person on the team yeah right like as, even in bobsled like we have some bobsled athletes and uh in bobsled it's it's more towards the weightlifting powerlifting end of the spectrum where like brute strength and speed kind of like dominate over any other qualities. And so just getting stronger will probably do a lot for you in that sport, but bench pressing is not bobsledding and the best bench pressers are not the best bobsledders. So sometimes athletes get confused. They're like, um, you know, the best bobsledders have like pretty big bench presses. So if I get that bench press, I should be good at bobsled. Or if I get to that squat level, if I can squat that as much as that bobsledder, I'll be good at bobsled and they come to bobsled tryouts and they're terrible. <laughs> and they're like, Oh, if I just like get a little faster on the track, like I'll for sure be good at bobsled. And it just like, it, it's not the sport. Sprinting is not the sport of bobsled bench pressing and squatting is not the sport of bobsled. And so there's some carryover, but not com- like not complete perfect carryover. Um, so people get um, caught in that a lot. Strength coaches get caught in that a lot. Yeah, right. strength coaches definitely get caught in that because it's kind of a marketability thing because if you can just demonstrate on paper, okay, I took this number from this number to that number. Look at me, I did a good job. But did that make them better at their sport? That's a little harder to demonstrate. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Nick says this really um, nicely in another podcast that he did. Um, but like, we both worked for the Canadian Sport Institute in the past. And I would say that's like a, prestigious job and it's a a stressful job because you know you're working with the best athletes in the world and he said you know when he first started working for them he was working with um and towards the end he was working with like a huge range of speed skating programs from like the development level to the national team level and you know through multiple olympic cycles and because so many practitioners at csi um as our example like work with the same athlete so it's like an integrated sport team model where like you've got your sports psych, you've got your strength coach, you've got your team doctor, you've got your head coach, physiologist, like you've got all these little plugins into the one, into one athlete. Um, each person will keep their job if they can demonstrate that they did their job. So from a strength conditioning coach perspective, if you can demonstrate that you got the athlete stronger or you increase their vertical jump or you increase their beep test or something, if you have some measurable ways of showing that you uh, did your job, so to speak, then you kind of like wash your hands and you're like, I'm good. Like I'm going to be keeping my job. Um, and that's how kind of Nick said it. He's like, yeah, I just kind of like need to get people stronger and like a little bit fitter. And then like people were like, okay, hey, good job. You did your job. But uh, the longer you're in the, in that world, you you realize like, oh yeah, the strongest person is not the best athlete. And like, oh wow we improved their like vo2 max test by five mils per kilogram per minute like congrats to us 
And then like, why didn't they perform better on ice or like their times aren't faster. So that's weird. Or like they didn't score more goals in hockey or something like that's weird. So you start to see this over and over again, where the, the best athletes on paper um, don't, Necess- aren't necessarily the best performers um yeah so that's a problem because you can't just wash your hands and say like well I did my job so I don't know why the athlete's not getting better like you need to be better than that is kind of our our thing um and so how do you be better than that well now you start ta- you should start talking to like the sports psychologist and learning a little bit about that you should start talking to the physiotherapist learning a little bit more about that and how your job can influence their job and vice versa and so um, through those like integrated models, now you can start to get a better idea of what influences performance. Um, and of course it is still partly strength and it is still partly physiology and it is mental performance. Um, but it's looking at the whole, not the parts. Yeah, that's definitely a good way to look at it. But how do you think we can influence society's vision on that? Because it seems like the typical way that you were saying CSI looks at it is, okay, this person did their job, this person did their job. How can we kind of change that model to make it look at performance in the sport rather than all these different variables coming from different sources? Um, I think it just requires like more literally, like more integrated communication, better communication, but more sit downs, more, you know, round table discussions where like, you bring all the testing results to the table. And if the athletes still not performing better then you all brainstorm together, why is that not happening? Um, I just don't think those conversations are happening enough. Um, And I'm not saying that the CSI doesn't do that. They totally do. I'm just saying like, as a general, as a general generalization, I guess, in the industry, um, we need like ourselves to be more uh, good at like contacting the physiotherapist and being like, Hey man, like, I don't know why, but my, my athletes wrist, just keeps jamming. I can't be able to do push-ups. I really want them to be able to do push-ups for X, Y, Z reason. Yeah. And then just brainstorming with the physio, um, why that's happening, uh, ways to avoid that. But like, there's a little bit of pride in both, like in all sectors. Yeah. The strength coach is like, no, like we, I'll find a way to get around it. And then the physio being like, the stupid strength coach keeps like loading the athlete in the way that's hurting them. But I'm not going to say anything because then the athlete will keep coming back to me. Um, so I think we just need to like drop our pride and, uh, problem solve together. And then like the athlete and clients will be better off for it. Yeah. I think that sounds like a good idea. Is there a section in your book about communication within the IST? Yeah, we have a chapter on sort of like, we call it problems within the IST. Um, and yeah, we do talk about that a little bit in the book. Nice. That'll be interesting. I'm always yeah, most interested too. in the sociological side of things when it comes to communication and perception. Mm. Yeah, I mean, definitely we're not necessarily experts in that realm, but um, yeah. we, we um, give some examples of like how things could change or how we can start to shift our mindset away from like, I just need to get someone stronger and then my job is done, you know? Yeah. So when gathering all the examples that you use in this book, what sort of populations do you find yourself working with? Because I know you work with bobsleigh and skeleton quite a bit but what other sorts of populations do you work with um yeah we have a a handful of bobsledders skeleton athletes um i work with uh, the women's dinos hockey team um vital or like nick also works with the dino swim team um we have a lot of endurance athlete clients um so dave proctor is probably our most like notable ultra endurance uh client and then we have a series of like other sort of in the athletics world um olympic level kind of athletes there um a lot of pain clients like that get referred to us for various reasons for various parts of their body um either from other clients or other uh practitioners in calgary um so that's good um i mean we really don't we really don't not work with one sport like we probably have had a lacrosse at well we have a lacrosse athlete right now or a few of them but we've had ring up before you know we've had soccer players we've had um tennis players we've had um like just such a huge range um that we like that's definitely not our niche we don't have one sport niche that's for sure just everybody (laughs) so i was talking to my like 
um, or not to, to my, I was talking to a uh, social media professional um, that I know who's like a, the wife of a, a, a friend here. And she kind of said like, what's your, what's your niche? Like what kind of like population do you work with? And I was like, everyone, is that like, a, is that an answer? And she's like, so nothing more, like nothing more narrow than that. I'm like, no, it's just everyone. Like we literally accept ad- anyone could come here. It's very inclusive. <laughs> yeah. Cause your niche is kind of everyone, but looking at things more detail oriented than most would. Right. And like, maybe not everybody needs that type of service or maybe not everybody needs um, to like dive into more kind of, I don't know, complex ways of looking at things um, in a simple, like we simplify things, but uh, we, we like our tagline, I guess, is like driven by complex cases because um, we tend to have people come to us that are like, Hey, I've, I have this like super complicated, like sport history. I've have, have had all these weird injuries. This is how they're presenting themselves in weird ways. I can't seem to figure them out in the perfect way. Um, strength training makes things sometimes better, sometimes worse, you know, like they just have this laundry list of like, of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's kind of, that's kind of like the, the, the niche is like everybody, but people who like have had these really complex things and can't figure them out. Um, even from an athletics perspective, some people are, are athletes and they like, can't make it to the next level. And they're like, I've tried everything. I've tried getting stronger. I've tried like this coach. I've tried this coach. I've tried physios. I've tried all these things. And we're like, okay, let's like look at performance from our perspective, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, like you said before, where there's that spectrum of things, sports that just need more strength, bigger engine versus sports that need a little more nuance. So I guess you probably work less with sports like powerlifting and weightlifting where they just need to get stronger and faster most of the time, unless there is specific cases of injury or whatnot. And then you probably work more with the little more complex cases. Yeah. Like, I guess we typically don't see like powerlifters or Olympic lifters unless they're injured. Um, because I mean, I, well, a, we can't drop weights here at our gym, so that would really piss them off. Um, but number two is it's, yeah, not, that would be not our niche. Like just, um, like we don't, we aren't experienced, I guess, in like taking someone to a weightlifting competition or like a powerlifting competition, yeah. Um, and there's really good coaches like, like you guys, um, that are really good at getting people really strong and really technically like proficient at Olympic lifting. Um, so we would just refer out for that because, um, not that that's not a complex case. It's yeah. just that that, that is, uh, not our main niche, I guess. Yeah. Um, is there any specific population that you enjoy working with most out of all of those? Um, it's always fun to take on like a new type of athlete that I've never dealt with before. Um, when I first had my first bobsledders, I thought that was pretty fun because I had never, I'm not a power athlete. I've never, um, been one to like want to, or have a desire to like lift super heavy or run super fast. I'm like an endurance athlete. So working with bobsledders for the first time was really cool. Um, it still continues to be really cool because there's a lot about the sport that I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't say there's one population I like working with the most um, because they're all, um, they're, yeah, they're all, people are all really fun to work with. Um, I must say like two ends of the spectrum. I'm, I'm thinking now about endurance athletes too. So like learning a lot about bobsled and then trying to refine our process on that is interesting. And then on the endurance side, like I am an endurance athlete, um, but man, endurance athletes just uh, don't know what they don't know. (laughs) They don't necessarily know how much their movements impact Mm. their injuries. And maybe this is at every level, I guess, too, but um, they've been taught that like running efficiently is like not, is like not moving. It's like keeping their shoulders super square, keeping their head super square, like just shuffling. They've been taught that that's like really efficient. Then they come in with like terrible gait terrible movement tons of injuries tons of pain and they're like this is just normal like this is endurance training um and it doesn't have to be that way i mean if you're going to be running 
hundreds of kilometers and miles um, at, at a time, like some of them do, which is crazy. Of course, you're going to get into trouble at some point. Um, but a lot of just like sub elite endurance athletes just have no idea how much better they could feel if they just adopted like a few different principles, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That That's something sense. that I think I see a lot with endurance athletes is a lot of them go in with the mindset of, okay, my training is eight sets of however much very structured training. I'm going to ignore how I feel and then just run as hard as I can, get my VO2 max up as high as I can. So I think it kind of is similar on both ends of the endurance versus strength power spectrum where you have your power lifters and your weight lifters are like, okay, I just need to get stronger. And then you have your endurance, some of your endurance athletes are just like, okay, I just need to get my VO2 max up and then I'll be better. Right. Yeah. Or like, I just need to run further yeah. and like, I'll eventually get fitter. Um, and have you read like Charlie Francis's stuff or like listen to his speak, like speaking and stuff? No, I haven't. So yeah, Charlie Francis is interesting. Um, he's the, like a famous Canadian track and field coach yeah. and he's coached like um, some very, very elite sprinters. Um, and he talks a lot about like the long to short versus the short to long model. Like he just simplifies it into like kind of those main two categories. There's a third too, but, um, the like long to short model would be for sprinters. And this can be adapted to endurance athletes would be, um, let's say like eight weeks before competition and those like one or two blocks before, um, you need to run your fastest at the competition. You start, you should start, um, say eight weeks prior with the longest distances. So you're going to do 800 meter repeats. And as you get closer and closer and closer to your like 100 meter event, you just like taper down the long distances into the short distances. In other words, it's kind of like, it's kind of like an endurance model for sprinting. Like some coaches do follow that where they're like, do 800 meter repeats. Um, okay. Now do 400 meter repeats and get really fit so that when you do the hundred meter race, like, I don't know, do speed later. And then the short yeah. to long model is like, you're going to start with like speed. You're going to start with like 25s and 50s and you have to be hitting the, the speeds that you need to be competitive at the hundred meter event eight weeks from now. So if you can't hit the speed you need to hit now, like we're going to push you to like get really, 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 really fast. We're not going to waste any of our time on anything long distance, more long distance um at all so once you can hit the speed for like 10 meters or 25 meters then we just start pushing the distances up so short to long now you get longer and longer distances as you can maintain that speed yeah um and then at the 100 meter event you're like more sure if you could hit those speeds because you've practiced them the entire time yeah um and the endurance community would be like more the long to short like let's just build a huge base and like let's just do 50 times the distance that you actually need for your event like literally a 5k runner sometimes is doing like a 25k run in their training yeah even though it's nowhere near the distance time pace anything of their event this is really common um and i would say that's like what 99 percent of all endurance coaches do they're like long to short and lately I've been playing around with the idea and trying to like integrate it into my programming, like, or trying it with certain athletes is like more of like a short to long model. It's like, okay, you want to run a half marathon with that pace. Can you even hit that pace for a minute? Can you yeah. hit it for two minutes? Can you hit it for 10 K already? Well, now, now we know the end point. We know how much time we have to get there and we can go like longer and longer time periods at that pace or more and more intervals at that pace. Um, and that's probably less, uh hard on the body like the overall volume is probably less um depending on how else you do it but uh, or how else you integrate stuff in there but um yeah i don't know yeah. how we got on this topic but <laughs> yeah i don't know I, either. I think i don't even know how we got here but yeah charlie francis is super interesting endurance athletes uh maybe we have it all backwards um but yeah endurance athletes tend to do too much volume speed athletes too they tend to do sometimes too much volume they do way too many you know long 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 repeats unrelated you know sand workouts or whatever and then um when it's time to run fast they like haven't run that fast in a long time they never even tried that testing uh distance or they've never tried running through lights and so on the day of the event they're like 
no idea where I'm at, but like, here we go. Um, which maybe is also an injury risk too. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a good example of a gap analysis because in that short to long model, you're kind of just looking at what the issue is and then critically thinking, okay, how do we fix the problem rather than jumping to classical linear periodization because classical linear periodization, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah, basically like in essence, like a gap analysis of movements um, and this could be a gap analysis of fitness too, uh-huh. but a gap analysis of movement would be, um, it would basically like help you um, determine a strategy for programming um, and for problem solving, like moving forward. So if you notice the athlete moving in a certain way, so we haven't talked really about this yet, but if you have a runner, let's say, and you notice them like moving in a certain way that's different from the way that you consider ideal technique, you can transfer, um, you, you can change, I guess, that, that uh, way of their running in like three ways. You can either, one, don't strengthen the pattern of their current strategy or the current dominant or let their uh, current dominant patterns like atrophy. Um, you can, there's a lot of examples of that. One would be in weightlifting. If someone's like keeps um, missing their clean because they're too hinged forward and they keep dumping the bar forward, then you could like let the hinge hinge pattern and hinge strength at atrophy um, or just train upright front squats a whole ton so that they get way stronger like, like that. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's number two. Number two is like strengthen the patterns and muscles associated with the way that you want them to move. And number three would be like to retrain the, the pattern completely from the ground up. In running, that could be, hey, I really hate the way you're like pronating so hard. You have a history of tearing your tib post. You have um, a calcaneal bursa or like, I don't know, you've got plantar fasciitis. You've got all these things that are hurting you. Um, plus, I don't think that's the way you, I want you to move. So let's not train anything in the gym related to pronation and let's just let that atrophy. Let's uh, strengthen, number two, let's strengthen the patterns associated with the way we want to move. So let's strengthen supination a whole ton. Um, and number three, like if, especially if those two aren't working or in conjunction with those two, let's retrain you completely from the ground up, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, so I guess like in programming or um, in, in the example of running, like we kind of just talked about, like you can, like some strength coaches, I'm just thinking of one in general uh, that has been up on my social media whole time lately and no hate on him, but like Pat Davidson keeps saying like, oh, you, you like these movements are unrelated or, and functional is stupid and like whatever, whatever. Um, but if you want somebody to run in a certain way and you like never, you never like it's, this is usually because strength coaches don't know what they're talking. Like they don't know anything about the sport is like common. And so when they're in the weight room, they're just like, yeah, squat, hinge, deadlift, pull, blah, blah, blah. Um, but if you don't retrain that movement pattern, um, that you think is maybe detrimental to them, um, you're kind of still setting them up for like lack of success. You're, they yeah. still have no idea how to move properly. They still have no idea. What do you mean? I'm pronating too much. Like you should be building them up from the ground up. Um, I think, and giving them many examples and contexts in the weight room, even of like how to do the thing properly. I don't know if this applies to weightlifting. I'm pretty sure it does, but uh, I think it applies to every sport actually. Yeah, definitely. I can see how it would apply to every sport, especially weightlifting. Cause like you said, if someone's hinging too much, maybe have them work on upright front squats more because then you're going to reinforce the good pattern, let the bad pattern atrophy. Yeah. yeah. And, and, or retrain them from the ground up. It's like, wow, you're doing everything wrong about that. Let's just like go back to basics with the dowel and retrain everything. Um, yeah. And like another good example of that is again, with any sport, um, we could use the example of speed skating because it's fresh in my memory. Um, you know, if the, if the coach is saying to the athlete, like on the ice, like, Hey, get lower, we need you to get lower to the ice. You need to like go down lower. Um, and the athlete doesn't do it. And then the coach says like, yells at him, like, come on, get lower. You need to get lower. Like we, we see this all the time in coaching, like coaches getting really angry and frustrated because they're saying a thing to the athlete and the athlete's not doing it. Um, so the typical thing for the strength coach to do is like, Oh, this athlete's so stupid or like yell at them. Um, when really like you can 
literally doing gap analysis and try to figure out like, well, what actually is the problem? So like step one, what's the needs analysis? Needs analysis is uh, what does the speed skater need to get low on the ice? And so you do a needs analysis and you're like, hmm, they need really good dorsiflexion at their ankle. Um, they need really good knee flexion. They need good uh, hip flexion and they need some spine flexion. And so you do a needs analysis. You're like, these are all the things they need to get low. Um, and then you try that with the athlete. You're like, okay, athlete, like we need all these things, do it. And they don't do it. So that's, it's like, it's not being met. Step two is the gap analysis. And you can do this passively. So you would like take them on the table, lay them down, use your physio um, or whatever, like however you need to assess this passively. You can passively assess, do they have enough dorsiflexion? Do they have enough knee flexion? Do they have enough hip flexion and spine flexion? You can do this in an assessment, right? And then you can just determine then and there, like is, is, the, is it just that they don't have the passive range? And then you can determine again with your therapy team, can we improve this passive range of motion? Is it something that can change? Or is this something that's stuck and we can't change the bones or something? Um, so let's pretend that they do have the passive range in their ankles or whatever. Then you can do like step three, um, an active gap analysis, basically. So now they have the ankle dorsiflexion range. Can they, can they get themselves into a position with no load on their back in the weight room, with no speed skates on, whatever? Can they just get that range of motion um, with their body weight, like through some coaching? And if yes, but then they like come out of it really quick because they're, they're like, oh, that's really like hard or that's really tight. Um, then maybe you just need to like train them to hold that position for longer and like, and like load that position so that they have more ability to stay in that position. Yeah. And that would be like your active, your active portion of your, I guess, analysis. And if they, they do have the active range and they are able to get down there and they are able to hold it for some amount of time, um, but not on the ice when they get back into the ice thing. Um, or into the sport when you reintegrate them then maybe um, it's a strength ratio thing so maybe it's like they can get into that position they can hold it for a bit but then like their quads die like on the ice they're just, just like they just can't and so maybe in the weight room now you um, just train isolate like in an isolated way or in an integrated way like in skating the patients maybe you just train the shit out of their quads and you're like, hey, quads, we're going to make you way stronger and way more able to like hold these positions. And, um, and that alone, like changing the strength ratios of the muscles, letting the hamstrings atrophy a little bit, maybe, or not touching them in the weight program. Um, hopefully then the, the, the ratio of strength helps them hold that lower position for longer. Yeah. yeah, I find that sociologically, a lot of coaches, specifically sport coaches, and more on the side of like, team sports or skill sports, whenever they give a cue to the athlete and they see that the athlete's not doing it, they just default to not trusting the athlete and thinking, oh, the athlete's bad. Why are they not doing this? And they don't just think, oh, my athlete is clearly trying because they like this sport. We got to figure out what's going wrong rather than just, why is the athlete bad? Why are they being bad? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like sometimes the athletes just don't like training like yeah they're in the sport because they like they like the sport yeah but they don't like weight room training and so they don't want to listen to either the coach or they don't want to listen to the strength conditioning coach because they're like i'm just here to play baseball guys like i don't want to squat <laughs> i don't yeah. want to i don't want to do shoulder external rotation exercises like that's boring to me so sometimes the athlete is just not interested and you have to find ways to keep them uh more interested i guess yeah Right. I think that covers just about everything we wanted to talk about. Let's get to get one or two questions from the Instagram there. Oh yeah. Um, so um, I guess one that came in is what kind of approach do I take when working with a new person, um, a new athlete? And so for us, um, we always start with an assessment um, and a full like exercise history um, and injury history. So we'd literally just sit them down at the beginning of the assessment and just ask them a whole bunch of questions, um, you know, all the way back to as far as they can remember, basically. Um, I find, I learned this from physios, I believe, but um, it tends to be sometimes that 
um, injuries that happen a long time ago can still um, give you clues into why they're feeling a certain way now. Um, one of our athletes, um, she was an, a runner and the physio we were working with um, upon intake was asked, uh, and upon both of our intakes, we were talking about, oh, you know, this and that, an injury. And she goes, yeah, and I like had a kid before. And I'm like, oh yeah, any complications with that? Or did you have a C-section if you don't mind me asking kind of thing? And she's like, uh, I think she didn't have a C-section, but she had a period afterwards um, after giving birth where like um, she had sepsis. So like a big infection in her abdomen, which resulted in like a ton of scar tissue and a ton of um, problems in that area. And so the physio we were working with um, kind of flagged that and started doing a ton of soft tissue release in her abdomen and she had hip pain, but like in the opposite hip. Um, but even just like that little red flag and like just kind of tackling it and seeing if there was any changes after those treatments, like really helped. Um, in like, in conjunction with like, I don't, I wouldn't like touch somebody's stomach in my treatment, in my yeah. uh, sessions, but in conjunction with, okay, let's add in a little bit more like lacrosse ball rolling in those areas that we didn't think about before. And uh, let's still tackle it from a strength perspective. Um, so anyways, we do a huge intake. Um, and then we would start by studying their sport. Probably if it was a new athlete. You would, you know, I, I don't know anything about baseball, but if it was a baseball athlete, I would go and try to learn as much as I can about baseball, talk to coaches of baseball, um, talk to athletes that play baseball, look on Instagram. Um, there's tons of good, you know, video there, which is a good starting point. Um, and that's, I guess, the starting point for working with a new person. Um, yeah. And then another question that came in was my perspective on Nordic hamstring curls, foot squats and VMO squats. And then you and I just talked about this quickly before um, the podcast started and maybe we can both answer it too, but um, I don't know if I have a perspective like on any given exercise there's so many variations of every single exercise that you can possibly give. Um, but the Nordic hamstring curls one is a funny one because, um, um, I don't know, some coaches that work with sprinters or that will critique coaches that work with sprinters. If a sprinter injures their hamstrings, I've heard it so many times, like, Oh, I should have done more Nordic hamstring curls. Like that's the secret ticket to like not pulling your hamstrings and running. Um, I think, I think the opposite, like, I don't know if, if Nordic curls are the answer for anyone's hamstrings, um, unless I see them moving a certain way, that makes me think like that must be the weak link, unless their injury history tells me a certain thing about um, those things being weak. Or, you know, if if you're doing like a strength ratio gap analysis and you're like, that's, that's the side that's like really not strong, let's strengthen it in like relevant angles, then yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yes, uh, no perspective on general exercises, I don't think. <laughs> yep. Yeah, because there's a million different ways you can train the hamstrings. I don't know why there's this abstract reason that everyone thinks that Nordics are the gold standard because they're incredibly hard exercise that not a lot of people can do perfectly. And if that's not necessarily the gap, and then as a strength coach, you spend a whole ton of time working on that, and that's not even going to help fill the gap, then, well, you just wasted a lot of time. And it's kind of the same for any other exercise, because I always say, if you meet a strength coach that just for no particular reason says X exercise is the best and Y exercise is the worst, and you should never do Y exercise and you should always do X exercise. They don't know what they're talking about because they're just picking favorites without knowing what the question is. Yes, exactly. And, um, you know, if you aren't sure, um, you can either like, again, look at sort of the best movers in that sport and just see what type of training they're doing. That might be a good clue. It's not like copy the training that they're doing, um, but use those as clues. Like, okay, a lot of the others are using these types of exercises. Um, a lot of them are getting injured still. So maybe that's not the answer. Um, and the best in the world move this way. My athlete moves this way. Their gap is, oh, they when they swing through in their sprints, they don't extend their knee enough. Okay. Uh, then you can start to, you know, go down the chain of like, well, why is that happening? Do they have the passive? Do they have the active? Is it a strength ratio thing? Is it uh, just a cue thing? Like they just need to be cued to like 
swing through more or, or whatever. Um, so it seems like a simple process, I guess, to go through to just look at like, what's the gap. Um, but it's not always that easy, I guess. Yeah. It's not always that easy. And a lot of people get lured into the, okay, I'm just going to do a testing battery and oh no, their strength numbers are too low. I better get those up. Yeah. 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 And, and that's like, again, maybe a, maybe a good place to start. If I started with a new client though, I've never done maximal strength testing on the first day. So I have no idea what their, 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 their peak potential and strength squatting or something like that is because I don't think that's like important on the first day. I don't think it's safe on the first day to like do those things. I think there's so many other little gaps that we could um, tackle before what are their peak strength numbers. Um, From a team perspective, that changes a little bit because you don't necessarily have time um, to deal with each individual and to change the program individually. And so from a team perspective, that actually might make sense is like, uh, let's do some base training so that these people know how to squat and know how to lift and like know how to do the thing so that I don't injure them um, in the testing. But, you know, maybe I need a snapshot of like where all of these people are at and I can't, uh, I don't have time to, um, yeah, do something really individualized. So snapshot of other strength, snapshot of other conditioning, snapshot of some other things, flexibility, et cetera, all the things we learn in school, those things are um, useful, but uh, I think it can be done better on an individual level, which is why it's fun to work one-on-one. Yeah, because one-on-one, you do get more of that time to figure out what the individual gap is. But yeah, if you have 40 football players, then you're not going to be able to individualize for all of them. Then you're just going to have to generalize to the sport, get that battery of testing, maybe divide them up into three groups. Each group's going to have their own different focus based on where they scored. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, that would be probably like the gold standard of doing things is if you have so many athletes, like just do something like that. Um, and as you work with the team like more and more throughout the years then it becomes um this is why i loved also working with um daniel's women's hockey and danielle goyette specifically is because she the, the head coach was so um technique focused like on the ice like she could point out every time you did an edge wrong like in your skating and when you lost power um the way you were pushing or the way you were skating Um, and so then you start to have, and you start to get to know the way that the coach wants the athletes to move and you start to figure out what the movement gap is because you're watching them play hockey all the time. Mm -hmm. And because the coach is telling you like, man, like 80% of my players either can't get low or they can't corner properly, or if they can't extend their hip properly, um, I don't know what to do. And then you're like, oh, I can help with that. Like, let's tackle that a little bit in the weight room, live on the ice, a little bit off ice, um, teach them a little bit about that. And that becomes filling the gap of movement efficiency. Yeah. And that's why it's super important as a team strength and conditioning coach to go watch your team practice their sport rather than only ever see them in the weight room. Exactly. Yeah. Super important because again, just making them better at squatting is not necessarily going to make them a better athlete. Unfortunately, wish it was that easy. I wish it, yeah, if it was that easy, a lot of us wouldn't have jobs because people would just squat and they'd be fine. But yeah, we have our jobs. Yeah, exactly. Um, that is all the questions I got. I'll double check that. Uh, I'll double check that there's no other ones that came in really quick. Yeah, see if any came in while we were talking. Oh, another one. Um, how much work is it to stay on top of new research, and how do you manage it while coaching, etc.? Um, so Nick is the ultimate boss at this. Um, he likes to spend, I would say all of his free time, um, reading research. Um, and then he'll send me a lot of stuff that is interesting or like relevant to our clients or our interests or whatever. Um, and then from my perspective, actually just like working on the ebook daily, like I wouldn't say every day I work on it, but most days I'm thinking about it. I'm writing notes down for it, or I'm looking at relevant research um and saving it to like mendeley and so having something to make the research like interesting like not just looking up random papers and trying to like bore yourself through it but being like 
hmm, my athlete has like Hashimoto's. I don't know much about that. I'm going to read about that. I'm going to send them an article that's relevant to like helping them with that. Like make the research relevant for either the stuff you want to learn, the stuff people around you need to know um, or whatever. And this could honestly just be one a day. I don't yeah. think that's too much to ask. Um, I think there's a, is it the like David Goggins ch challenge or something? It's like, well, no drinking, exercising every day, whatever, but it's like read 10 pages a day mm -hmm. as part of that challenge. And I think that's a good, um, a good place to start. It doesn't have to be 10 pages of research. It could be 10 pages in a book, but, um, and if research doesn't interest you, definitely don't just yeah. read research. Um, I, I like to read it, so I'll mix it up with some stuff, but I don't know. Does that make sense? Like, is that how, is that what you do? I guess you're in your master's, so you have to read research. You're forced to. Yeah, I think it definitely helps to have a question. Like like yeah. you're saying, if you have a client that has something you don't know about, it's easier to be directed into what you're looking at. Because if you just are searching for papers to read, but you don't know what you want to read about, then Google Scholar has an infinite amount of things for you to look at. But yeah, mm -hmm. I'm in my master's, so I always end up gravitating towards the things I'm most interested in, which ends up being the sports sociology kind of thing. But mm. I kind of have an addendum to that question is where do you go to find your research? Because just searching for things seems super difficult because unless you know the specific key terms that you want to look at, then it's hot, kind of hard to find exactly what you want. So is there a certain way you go about it? Do you kind of look up research that interests you and then go through all the references on that and then pick your way through those? What's your method? Yeah. Um, well, when I used to have like a, an active university account, either at UFC or at Mount Royal, when I was teaching there, I would, um, have access to like all the, the research and very like good, um, search terms and things like that. So usually I could figure out a way to put in like all the relevant key terms. And then, like you said, refine it in that way, like look through the references or look through the sections that were, um, what I was trying to find and then find those articles um that's a good way of starting um i don't have any active university accounts so i don't get research for free anymore um so i tend to go on google scholar to start or google just google and finding the a paper that's relevant i also have like thousands of papers saved on my mendeley like that i've downloaded the pdfs and saved them there so i have like a pretty broad range of stuff already saved um that i can search through as needed um, but then there's, I think it's called Sci-Hub. Um, oh, yeah. I have it saved on my desktop, but I, I use Sci-Hub a lot to find the full PDFs. It's not great for, um, it's not great for the newest research. Like if something came out in the last six months, it's usually not on Sci-Hub yet. Um, but yeah, but it's yeah, kind of the best things... way to get free access to stuff if you don't have that university yeah. account. And even if you do have a yeah. university account, Sci-Hub is usually just simpler than trying to wade through and unlock shit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I don't know, a combination of search terms, previously downloaded stuff. Um, when you do your master's, you just read so much of the relevant research in the stuff you're interested in that um, that's a really good start because it also forces you, I guess, not just the stuff you're interested in. It forces you to look at the stuff you're not even interested in. Um, so that's, I don't know if that's a good answer, but that's kind of a good start at least for people. Yeah, I think the broadest way to answer that is be interested in something and go find it. So if you have no it, interest yeah. to begin with, then it doesn't even matter. Yeah. And like do it when you're like fresh, like do it maybe in the morning when you're you wake up and you've got like an inspo, <laughs> not at the end of the day when you're like crushed from work and then you're just trying to fit in the 10 page of reading um, or trying to find an article just for the sake of doing so. Like I like to try to do it when I'm fresh. So right in the morning. Yep, do it when you're caffeinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's one way of doing it. Yep. Yeah. All right, Carla, where can people find you on the social medias and on the websites? Um, our website is actually I'll start with social media because that's more popular. Um, our social media, our Instagram is at Vital Strength Physiology. Um, our website is just www.vitalstrengthphysiology.com. Um I don't think I, I think I deleted Twitter. I don't think I've got a very updated LinkedIn anymore. Facebook, we don't really use. We just post all the Instagram stuff over to Facebook. Um, yeah. So Instagram is probably the best one on the website. Um, we've got 
a uh, little link tree link on our um, Instagram bio. And that's where we, we're trying to easily direct people to either um, get waitlisted for the gap analysis ebook or uh, waitlisted for our foot foundations program that we'll hopefully be releasing both of those later this year. If we can stay on top of all the stuff we want to do with those. Um, and then we're looking for an intern for our dinos program starting in the fall. So if this gets released before like September 1st, um, this episode, um, we'll be looking for yeah, a fall intern and a winter intern for our swimming team and our dinos hockey team. So again, follow the link on our Instagram bio and there's a application form on there. Perfect. For anyone who's interested in listening. Okay. And where in Calgary are you guys located? Um, we're in the mission. So we're renting out of a space off fourth street. Um, I, we're on Google maps now, so you can just Google maps us and find us easy. All right. Perfect. So if anybody's interested, get on that wait list for gap analysis. Do you have an estimate of when that's going to be out? Um, it's like 75% done and it's been 75% done for like two months. Um, <laughs> yeah, every time you get estimate... a little more done, there's always more that you want to add, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then more refining we want to do. So if it gets released by the end of 2021, I'll be super happy. Um, at this point, I'm just surviving. <laughs> yeah. I'm not to drown right now. So yeah, we'll try. Well, I can't wait to read it. And I'm sure after you release it, there's going to be a second edition and a third edition eventually as you add it. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Thanks for being on, Carla. No worries. Thanks for having me.